Oh, is that not awesome? Yeah. Man, I tell you, it was worth it to move here from Michigan. <laughs> now, I'm serious. I, the, one of the first things I just want to say, uh, the first thing I want to say is to every one of you in this room that pours your life and your heart and your soul into this church. And you need to remember that every minute, every time you spend any bit of your talent and your love and you share your heart, every dollar that goes into the offering bag, every part of your being, and no matter how small or big that you have sacrificed into this church, is helping to make that happen right there. And you need to know that, that it is never, as the scriptures tell us, don't ever grow weary, right, in doing good. Don't ever grow weary in doing good. Because one of the greatest things for me, every time we do a baptism, is it reminds me God is still alive, He's still loving people, He's still working, and He's still changing people's lives. And the fact that we get to be a part of that is the most humbling, most glorifying, and I can't believe it's still emotional after two services, but it's just, you just realize that what we give our lives to is actually changing people's lives. So please, be encouraged, and let's stay the fight, and let's go for it and see what God's going to do. Because today is a great celebration. How many of you like to celebrate? Right? I'm, oh, man. Woo! Wow, you guys are alive today. That's awesome. Yeah, I was thinking about that. Like, why do we celebrate? We celebrate lots of different things. We celebrate victories, right? In sports or in politics or in war, if there's a victory. I mean, you celebrate a victory. You celebrate new things when someone's born or, or when there's a wedding or when there's a ribbon cutting ceremony because it's a new building. We celebrate those things when they're new. We celebrate great events. That's what holidays are. They're, they're a chance for us to celebrate great things that have happened or birthdays or anniversaries when they're personal. And so I just sit here today and I think about this. Are we celebrating a great event today? Yeah. You guys have, no, some, some of us have no idea how great The thing is we're actually celebrating because what we're celebrating today is this. The fact that God so loved the world that he would send his one and only son into the world. And as Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn the world. I came to save the world. And what we celebrate on this day is one of the greatest events, not one of, the greatest event in all of human history. The fact that God in Christ would actually die. Isn't that weird? We're celebrating a death. Which, which again, we talked about last week a little bit, but in Jesus Christ, what we do is we celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ would die for us so that all of our sin could be wiped out, so that we could be reconciled back to God how we were originally created to be. That's a great event, but that was just the beginning, right? Because after he died, the most amazing event was that he rose again. We celebrate today in baptism the fact that Jesus Christ not only died, but he rose again and he's living right now as the risen Savior. So we celebrate because that's a great event. It's unbelievable. Are we celebrating victory? Yes. Do you guys know that when Jesus Christ died, what happened was is he claimed victory over sin and over death? Yeah, that's really good news. It really is that there is actually a power that's more powerful than sin, that God in flesh could actually walk this world and never sin. Something you and I can't do, but he has the power to do it. And then when he died, of course, because he rose from the dead, even death couldn't hold him down. And so one of the greatest things for us is there's never any reason to fear death. I have no fear of death. How about you? Absolutely none. I have no fear to stand before God because I'm awesome. No, no, you guys know that. No, I have no fear to stand before God because every sin of mine, yesterday's, today's, and tomorrow's, was in Jesus Christ's body when he was on the tree and it's already been paid for. So I have no fear of death. This is a victory, man. And so we celebrate. And then is this a new thing? You guys, we are celebrating today a new thing. These lives that we just watched on the baptism are forever now united with God. And before, they weren't. That's new. They walked this earth by themselves, trying to figure it out, trying to figure out their purpose, trying to find strength, trying to get over their lives and the mistakes they made, trying to stop the things that keep screwing up their relationships. And then finally, at some point, 
they decided, you know what, that old life, that just ain't worth it anymore. And they brought Jesus Christ into their life. And at a moment, all of a sudden, God was living in their heart. There was a spiritual transaction that took place that was real. And I know that some of you in here, the way we call it is, you are on a spiritual journey here. And, you, and you've come today. And you've wondered about your spiritual life and could anything really take place. And I want to tell you, there is a spiritual reality. Sometimes I think that Christianity gets viewed as the least spiritual religion out there. Because we have all this kind of church stuff that we do. I want to tell you, there's a deeper reality in Christ than you will ever taste in anything else. So, I want to read for you Romans chapter 6, which is the passage that we do often when we do our baptisms. Just to let you know, I wanna, we have so much to celebrate today. Victory. We have victory to celebrate today. We have a new thing that's taken place. And we have a greatest event in all of history. And look at what it says here. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Now let's go back and let me read this with you again. Don't you know? Now, if you're, if you're here today and, and Christianity is new and you're just even wondering about this crazy faith and this weird religion and you're wondering what this could be, I, don't you know It's not really to you. This is something new for you. But for all of you in this room who would raise your hand and say, I'm a follower of Christ. I've been baptized. Listen to this. Don't you know then that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? What does that mean? It's this, that there is an incredible union that has taken place when you put your faith in Christ. It is a mystery. In fact, it's called the greatest mystery. The fact that Christ is now in you and that you are in Him. So baptism means to immerse into the water, but that's just a symbol of the spiritual reality that took place when you put your faith in Christ. When you put your faith in Christ, you became in Christ, the Scripture says. And He became in you. You now are united with Him. And so it says, don't you know then that when He died, you died. See, all of a sudden, then what's that mean? Well, that means there's this, there's this old person that I was talking about. There's this person that every single one of us has, or some of us had, where we didn't care about God. We didn't want to follow His ways. We wanted to do our own thing. And what happened when you got baptized into Christ, that old person died. Is that good news? No, man, some of us are going, you have no idea how good news that was. Because that person was screwing up my life. That person was so self-centered, every relationship I ever tried to make happen failed. That person had absolutely no power over the things that I got addicted to. That person was killing me. So thank you, Jesus, for killing me. Because when you were baptized into Christ, you were baptized into his death, and that person was done. But then what's it say? The next verse. We were therefore buried with him, with him, through baptism, into death, in order that, oh, now the good part comes. So that's good news, but there's better news. The reason that he died was what? In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Yeah, it's great for the three of you. You rock. No, I'm serious. Like, this is, this is the hope. This is the hope. And I don't know, for every one of us who are sitting here today, do you know that you can be in Christ and Christ is sitting at the right hand of God with all authority and with all power, with pure holy love. And he says, and I want to live in you. I want to be enmeshed in you. And I want you to have a spiritual experience like you never dreamed you could have had. That's what's supposed to be happening here. How many of you in here would say that you want a new life? Anybody here want a new life? All right. How many of you would like to say, how many of you would just like to have a new beginning? Anybody want a new beginning from today? Okay, you guys are better in the first service. 
If you're looking for a new life today, if you are looking today for a new beginning, can I tell you something today? God wants to do something new in you. He wants to do something new in you. It's who He is. It's what He's all about. How many of you in here like new things? Anybody like new things? Come on, you Americans. Come on. Come on, whatever. Oh, no, I'm very content and satisfied. You liar. We love new things, right? You get in a brand new car and it's like, oh, the smell of that thing is just unbelievable. It's so enticing. It lures you. You've got to have that new car. I really like where we live, but every time I walk around my neighborhood, I go, oh, but to live there. You know, just to have that house, to have something new. Some of you, it's like simply just put on some new clothes, right? You put on a new shirt and it's like, oh, yes, it's so satisfying. How many of you could use a new job? Yeah. I mean, wow, the thought of a new job. And you know what's weird too? Some of you are sitting right here, don't raise your hand on this one, because some of you are thinking, man, if I could just have a new relationship, this one's getting kind of old, you know? Something new would be really exciting right now. But then <clears throat> there's this whole, this whole other lot of you, some of you are sitting here going, yeah, you know, all that stuff, that doesn't, I don't care about jobs and, and, and homes and cars, you really don't. But I tell you this, you love new experiences. You want a new idea a new philosophy, maybe, to live by, a new adventure, something new to discover. You know what I love? I, I, what I love this new, I love new places. Anybody love new places? I mean, I just, I love to travel. Like Susan and I, we went to England and Scotland for our honeymoon, and it was so awesome that when we think about like 10th year, 15th year, we go, oh, let's go back to England and Scotland. I know like, but, but let, let's do something new. Let's go to Italy, you know, let's go to Spain. Let's, let's try something new. I love living here in Utah because every time I go somewhere, there's a chance for a new hike, a new discovery, a new waterfall, a new canyon. And isn't it weird? There's something inside of you that just goes, somehow walking the same hike will be nice, but a new one will be better. How many of you like new food? I love new food. You know, I love new restaurants. All, all, Susan and I, man, forget the chains, baby. We want to go to the local joints and we want to go at a different one every time. We, wish was, we want to discover what's out there. Why? Why do we do this? You ever, seriously, think about this. Why are new things so tantalizing? Why is it so invigorating? So satisfying? So thrilling? It was really interesting. I, I Googled this stuff. I wanted to find out and I found an advertising company who actually studied this, because that's what they do, right? They try to get you and me to buy new things. So they thought, well, let's study this, see if we can figure out the human heart, and maybe we can figure out how to get people to want new things. Well, here's what they found, why we're so enamored with things that are new. First of all, because we think that something new is going to be better than what we currently have, right? I mean, you all of you who rail, oh, I want a new job. See, you think that job's going to be better than the one that you've got. Your home, a better home, a nicer home, a nicer car. When you think of a new relationship, somehow that new person will have their whole act together and it'll be just so good. I won't have to deal with the old stuff. You think it's going to be better. Why else are we so enamored with the new? Because we think that the new thing will bring us happiness and pleasure and satisfaction. Don't you? Oh, if I just had that. Oh, that'll fulfill me. Why else are we so enamored with the new? This is very interesting. Because we think, well, no, it does actually. It brings respect, love, and admiration of others. Doesn't it? If you got the new thing, especially where I live back in Detroit, you know, Detroit's tanking now, but when I was there, it was like the third richest county in America, Oakland County. And it was all about what you drive, where's your address, what do you wear. It was just, it was just, it's weird. And And you go back to that. And why? Because if I have the new thing, then I'm worth something. I have value and other people admire me. Here's what was interesting to me. And this was the most intriguing one. Why are we so enamored with new? Because there's this weird, passionate longing. They called it a hopeful anxiety when you think about there being something new. And so you imagine this thing will actually fulfill you. And what happens, we actually get addicted to the feeling of the thought that something might be new. See, because then what happens is what? You get the new thing and it didn't work. So you got to get the next thing. Absolutely, you good at that? All right. So 
You, you want the next thing, and then you get the next thing, and it feels good for a while, but the thrill's gone, and you like the thrill. Does that make sense to you? Now here, check this out. Quote right from the study. Passionate longing is not likely to be sustained for very long when we regard the object as being unattainable. Let me read it again. Passionate longing is not likely to be sustained for very long when we regard the object as being unattainable. In other words, right, I'll walk around or I'll drive around. I'll go, oh, dude, I would love to live there. But you know I'll never live there, <laughs> right? Or man, I would love to have that car. Well, I'll never get Oh, I'd love to go there, but I know I'll never go there. See, I have lots of dreams. You guys got dreams? So you have dreams, but you know they're unattainable. And so the passionate longing isn't really there. But what about the thing that you actually could get? Does that capture your attention? It drives you. It actually lures you because you think you could get it. You know, I was sitting there watching the Olympics, right? And I'm watching the guy and I'm thinking about the person. Because, you know, when you watch the Olympics, are you like me? And you go, well, that'll never happen, right? You guys know you'll never experience that. But what about the guy, and I think it was in the uh, gymnastics team, the guy sitting in the stands who was the one cut away from making the Olympic team. One cut away. Is that attainable? Yeah, what do you think he's going to do for the next four years? He is going to work his tail off because it's there. It's a passionate longing and it's attainable. Okay, here we go. You guys ready for this? Do you believe that experiencing God in your life is attainable? Do you believe that it's possible to have a new life? See, because when you don't think it's attainable, Eventually, you just die away. And I guarantee you, some of you in this room right here, you're thinking, man, I'd love to have a new life, but it just doesn't seem like it's ever going to work. And the passionate longing goes away. And I want to tell you guys, when we think about God, I just think for some of you, if you've never experienced that with God, I was thinking, why not? Why not? Why do you come to church and see stuff like that on the video listen to me or Andy speak or whatever and go, never had that. I have a couple suggestions maybe. One is this. The Bible makes it very, very clear. And you heard it on this video. It was awesome. Did you hear it over again? I was in church and I knew that God was there and Jesus was there, but I didn't know about the relationship. Did you hear that up there? I was doing the religious thing, but I didn't know I could actually know God through Christ. And I would say that maybe for some of you, the reason that you've never actually had a new life new creation experience is because you've done the religious thing. You go to church, you know, maybe you throw a dollar in the basket, you do the things that God wants you to do, but the Bible makes it very clear that the only way you ever have a transforming experience with God is by faith and not by works. It is by faith and not by works. There must come a point in your life at some time where you finally completely trust God with your life. Jesus himself said, unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. You can go to church. You can do religious things. You can rejoin religious organizations. You can read the Bible. You can pray. You can do all the spiritual stuff. But if there ever, if there is not an actual experience of transformation where you completely surrendered your life to God, then that new life is not there. So how do you do it? The first thing is, you guys, what's it take? And I don't know, if you came in here today and you're like, dude, I was just coming to church. Um, you know, and you, you, you know, your heel marks are out in the, in the uh, parking lot because someone dragged you here. I want to tell you this right now. I want to tell you this right now. If you need a new life, God wants to do something new in you. So what do you got to do? The first thing you have to do is confess to him that you haven't loved him, that you haven't followed him, and that you've never trusted him. You have to confess to God that you've been living your own life, and that's called sin. And you just have to admit to him that you've never really believed in him, even though maybe you've done religious things. He says, if you'll confess to me, 
I will be faithful and just and I'll forgive you. And then he says, what do you have to do next? And then you have to trust him. Can I just tell you, this is the hardest thing you will ever do, ever do in your human existence. The toughest thing to ever do is to give up control of your life. You know why? Because you think it's yours. My life? This is mine. And God sits up there and goes, no. Actually, uh, you're only here because I thought of you. You're only here because I gave you life. In fact, the scriptures are clear about this one. You're alive today because he wants you to be alive. But it's your life. But I'm telling you, the sinful nature within every one of us wants to be in control of our life. And the hardest thing that you will ever do, in fact, you will need the grace of God to do it, is to surrender your life. And I guarantee you, until that day, you may be religious, you might even be spiritual, but you will not be born again, and you will not enter the kingdom of God, and you'll never experience the actual new creation that God wants you to be. So if you want a new life today, at some point, you're going to have to confess to God and then turn it around and give Him control of your life. You know what that is, you guys? We call it here receiving. It's our first value at K2. You have to receive His forgiveness and you have to receive the Holy Spirit of God into your life. And I'm telling you, when that happens, a spiritual transaction will take place and you will never be the same again. And that's the deal right there. Can I tell you, if, if you just popped in to come to church today and you're checking out what Christianity is all about, I'm telling you right now, God wants to do something new in you. Now, let me turn the corner. For all of you who said, man, that's, I, I, I did that. <laughs> I got baptized. I believe. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Any followers of Jesus Christ in here who could use something new in your life? Okay, all of you who aren't Christians, you see that? See, here's the deal. Because somehow what we've got to make sure, because something what happens is, all of a sudden, we believe that what, you know, this, I had this one experience with God. Can I just say it? That one experience wasn't enough. And my, and my question with all this is this. If believers of Christ want something new, can I ask you this question? Do you have any hope that you're actually going to be different than you are today? Wow, good. I'm impressed. Because I'm telling you, I think many of us who are believers in Christ don't think it's attainable. I'll be honest with you, man. I have sat out many times with God, and I've just said, is this even possible? What'd you do, just tease me? Did you tease me with that fruit of the Spirit stuff? You know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. Yeah, yeah, you can have those, Dave. Yep, come on. Oh, just a little bit more. Come on. Oh, come on, come on. I mean, sometimes, I'll be totally honest with you, I'm like, am I ever going to change? Or is this just a joke? This incomparably great power stuff. You know? And so I sit before God and I wonder, okay? So here's where we go. All of you who are followers of Christ, can I just tell you something very clear today? God wants to do something new in you. How do I know that? Hebrews 10, 14 says this. By one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. By one sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, He has made you perfect forever. Is that good news? Yeah, that should be like really good news. That should be like, whew, okay. Because I'm telling you, if you think right now, by one sacrifice, Jesus Christ did enough to try to help you to be really good to get God to accept you into heaven. Oh, are you kidding me? That's not free, and that's such a burden. That's an incredible burden. But the scriptures tell us, no, by one sacrifice, you have been made perfect forever. And then what's it say? Those who are being made holy. In other words, what happened when you received Jesus Christ into your life? All of you who got baptized. Jesus says, you're born again. Oh my gosh, think about your children if you have any. 
Mariah and Ashlyn and Caleb. They are my children, period. Like forever. And nobody's going to change that. You have been made a child of God. And you are complete in Him. All of your sin was in His body on the tree. And you're completely forgiven. You're seen without blemish and without accusation, Colossians 1 tells us. I know that's unbelievable when you look in the mirror. But you've got to believe that it's true. The love of God for you was to take care of all of your sin. And you have been made perfect forever. But then what does he say? And if that happened, if you received that, you are being made holy. I'm telling you guys, you know what happened? See, when we got baptized, it wasn't like, oh yeah, woo! And God was like, that was awesome, let's celebrate! And then I'll see you in heaven. Good luck down there. No, I'm telling you, when you got baptized into Christ, it was so that you could live, which means walk, step by step, a new life. Your journey just began for crying out loud. That was supposed to be the beginning. God wants to do something new in you. Look at these other verses, 2 Corinthians 4, 16. Therefore, we don't lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away. Inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. 2 Corinthians three eighteen. We who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory. In other words, there's no separation between us and God. Now we've been completely reconciled to Him. He says, we are what? being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory which comes from the lord who is the spirit and you know what the bible says and all this is from god you know i I had to look up each one of these words being made holy being transformed being uh, renewed and you know what they're all present passive participles does that not excite you Man, you're all like, wow, Dave, thanks. You guys, but seriously, this is when Greek actually matters. Present means now with continual action. Being made holy, being made, being transformed. And passive means it's done to you. You don't do it. That's good news. The responsibility is God's. He's the one who's doing it. He wants to make you holy. He wants to make you transformed into the image of Christ. He wants to renew you day by day. And we're all sitting here going, I love new stuff. Well, if you love new stuff and you want a new life, then I'm telling you, you came in here today going, I'm going to come to church. And I'm telling you, you should walk out of here completely New. You have the opportunity to. You can go to church and play the church game. That's fine. Or you can walk into this place and say, are you telling me, God, that you can actually transform me? That you can actually make me holy? That you can actually renew me day by day? Bring it on. Bring it on. So here we go, you guys. I was just thinking about this. Because it, it was so cool, we were celebrating this wedding uh, last night. But it was fun to celebrate the wedding because the day before that, Susie and I had just celebrated our ninth anniversary. And it was so cool because you celebrate new things, right? But then this bridesmaid gets up and she says this. She goes, she holds up her glass and she goes, Tonight, there's, and she's talking to the bride and groom, she goes, Nothing could be more amazing to you. I know you're sitting here and you're thinking, This is the most incredible night of our life. And then she said, I want to tell you something. Years from now, you're going to look back at this night and you're going to say, that was nothing. And the coolest part was, I was sitting behind Sue's and I watched her head go like this. And I went, yes! (laughs) And some of you, I know, because marriage is so hard. After nine years, you're going, I want something new. But I'm telling you this, you can be married after nine years and Looking at Sim and Judy down here, you can be married for years and you can say, that was nothing. We were driving home and Susie said, you know what, Dave, when I think about it, my baptism, that was cool, but oh my gosh, that was nothing. I don't know about you, but that's how I feel. I, my baptism moment, my newness in Christ was cool, it's very emotional, it's really neat. 
I'm telling you, after 30 some years of following Jesus, that literally was hardly anything. And nothing frustrates me more. And I know people have had conversations here at K2 where they've talked to people and they say, because they're excited in their faith. And people will go, you who are mature, will look at them and say, well, don't worry, you know, that'll eventually pass away. And I just want to... No. I, I just, I just want to go, are you kidding me? What Jesus do you know? The one who said, let's get baptized and I'll see you in heaven? Or the one who said, you baptize into me and I will walk with you every moment of every day. And if you'll let me, I will transform you with ever increasing glory. You want something new? He's saying he'll give it to us. So here's a question. How? How? Is this crazy? Like, I have the answer. <laughs> I'm right with you guys. Nothing frustrates me more that I'm not, nothing frustrates me more that I'm not more like Jesus. But I still believe that he's going to keep changing me. It's his promise to me. And I'm going to hold on to it. How do we do it? There is a verse that says this, Colossians 2, 6. Just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him. Well, how did you receive Christ? If you're a follower of Christ today, you're sitting here today and you're going, I know I received Him. I know it was real. I believe. And it was transformational. And the scripture says, okay, good, 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 good. Then just as you received Him, continue to live how? In Him. So what did you have to do when you received Christ? The first thing you had to do, as I already shared with everybody else, is you had to what? You had to confess that you were a sinner. You had to confess the stuff when you weren't trusting Him, didn't love Him, were seeking yourself more than Him. Guess what? When you're a follower of Christ, you don't stop. There's still this issue inside you. And for some of you right now, to ever actually be new in Christ, what has to happen is you need to confess your sin. The Spirit's been working on you. He's been, he's been totally convicting you. You know you're doing stuff that's against Him, and you're just sitting there, how come my life's not new? Right there's why. So for some of you, the first step you need to do today, and you can do it right here before you leave, is you need to confess to God where you're sinning. And, if you, and, that's, and that's, I don't even know to go, need to go more into it. The second thing you need to do is what? He convicted you, you confessed your sin, and then what'd you do? You trusted him, you surrendered your life to him, and you said, come and live in me. And guess what? For some of you right now, as a follower of Christ, there are issues in your life right now where you don't trust him. You don't. And I don't have to say any more on that, because if you're a follower of Jesus, you know right now where you are doing your own thing instead of letting him do his thing. And guess what? Come on, man, let's not go to church today. You could, in our worship time today, confess that to God. And you could actually repent. And as Acts 3.18 says, you could receive times of refreshing from God. I want a new life. I want a new beginning. Okay, then let's get rid of all the stuff, all the other gods and all the other idols and all the selfishness that's keeping you from actually trusting God. What's the third thing you need to do? I'm going to pound you with guys all year on this one. You have got to be in this book. You know why? Do I have times when I don't trust God? Absolutely. Do I have questions when I doubt his goodness? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Do I have questions whether he loves me or not? Oh, more than you'd ever want to know. And so how do I get over those really hard times when I start to doubt God's goodness and his faithfulness? The only way I have any victory over that is this right here. I have to be in this book and I have to know what is true and I have to let him speak it directly to me through his Holy Spirit. And I know some of you are like, I already know the Bible. I don't care. You can know it, but you still have to be in it. This book is alive and it's active. They are God's words and he will speak directly to you. And I'm telling you, when everything around you is falling apart, and in fact, you're falling apart and you know you're weak and you don't have any ability to be the person you want to be. You are going to need a rock to stand on. And the rock is Jesus Christ. And the only way you're going to know it's true is if you go in here and hear what God has to say about you. I made you perfect forever. All of your sins were wiped out. You're my child. I will be absolutely faithful to you. Oh. Okay, good. Because like, if you love me because of how I acted, I'm toast. You got to have the word of God. And then you know what? Here's the, here's the fourth one for you. 
How else can I be new? You've got to fix your eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Some of you right now, you're a follower of Jesus, but, you're, you're, but by token, you're really following your own heart because that's what the world tells Follow your heart. And what's your heart doing? Oh, wow, wow. You are totally getting caught up in the things of this world. They are gathering all of your attention, all of your devotion, and all of your heart. And the scriptures tell us, you guys, we have to fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen because what is seen is temporary and what is unseen is eternal. And some of you just need to lay that before God today and say, dude, I've been so a friend of the world and I need to let it go. And then you know what you need to do? You need to train yourself to be godly. I I tell you, these Olympics are kicking my butt. I watch this and I watch a guy stand up there, a woman stand up there and get the gold medal around their neck and I watch them, I go, oh my goodness, these guys gave up their life for that. They got up at ungodly hours, only ate stuff that was healthy. They exercised, they put themselves in pain, they submitted themselves to a coach, and they did whatever he told them to do. Why? So they could stand and get a piece of metal put around their neck. And you guys know, if you know the Bible, the scripture says, come on. They run in such a way to win, and they put us to shame. And then the scriptures say, run in such a way to get the prize, because our crown is one that will last forever. What are you running for? I want to be new. I want more power. Are you totally getting rid of all the other stuff and running hard after Jesus? Last one, what do you need to do? Get ready for some pain, baby. Get ready for some pain. God says, oh, I love you so much. I got such great things for you. I am going to so discipline you. And it will never be pleasant at the time. But later on, however, it will produce a harvest of righteousness and peace. Oh, baby, I'm going to test your faith. And it's going to be suffering. Get ready. You know why? Because if you can persevere through suffering, eventually you'll be mature and complete and you'll lack absolutely nothing. If you really want, really want to be new, then God's going to go, oh, I'll do it. But it will be painful. And I'm telling you, if you're in a desert right now, if you feel like God's far away, he might just be loving you. So band, come on up. And here's your chance to either play church or to engage with God. Here's your chance. You all raise your hand. I want something new. I'm going to ask you, how bad do you want it? It's all up to you. Because God's doing it. God wants to do something new in you. He loves you. If you're sitting here today and you don't care about Him, doesn't matter. He cares about you. If you want nothing to do with him, doesn't matter because he wants everything to do with you. If you're a follower of Christ and you've not been loving the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, you haven't trusted him, you're not obeying him, you know by the word of God you can confess that. He will forgive you. You can repent from that and times of refreshing will come from the Lord. You walked in with a bunch of garbage that's weighing you down and hindering you from running the race and you could leave it right here, right now and you could walk out free. And he will completely respond to you. Whatever you want to do.